So this is just a little follow-up video with the boot and cue meter where we're going to try to do some interesting things like uh, measure inductors and capacitors and even try to build some simple capacitors uh, using some dielectric material and attempting to measure the dielectric constant of some of these materials. So this is just a little add-on video on the boot and cue meter before we put it away back on the shelf. So some stupid tricks with the Boonton 160A Q meter. Um, let's say we have a unknown capacitor and it's marked 220 plus or minus 5 percent. Now is that 22 puff or is that 220 puff? I don't know. So we, we run into stuff like this all the time. So what I've done is I've taken a high Q coil and I'm resonating it um, at a frequency that gives me a response with 400 picofarads in there. That way if I go up or I go down I've got plenty of range to work with. Uh, the Q is showing something around that's not quite 250 but it's close or, or 150 so so what am I getting? I'm getting about 125, 120. So that would be a Q of, uh, of 240. Now, let's attach the unknown capacitor to the capacitor terminals. And of course that's going to untune it. Okay, we've got the uh, capacitor. So now we're going to reduce the capacitance until we get a response. Now, if it were 22 puff, you know, all I would have had to do is just reduce it, you know, 22 puff. Around here it would have lit up. But, I'm having to go quite a ways, and here it comes. Okay, 180. So it is indeed a 220 puff capacitor. Remember, this is a calibrated variable, so I'm directly subtracting from the 400 and this is a 220. Also notice the Q has degraded uh, so this capacitor has degraded the Q of the tuned circuit. So we can say that the silver mica capacitor is not as high a Q as a precision variable capacitor. So we've learned two things about this capacitor. We've learned its value and we've learned what kind of cue it can support. So oftentimes we want to actually measure the inductance of coils. And the uh, boot and cue meter can do that. And uh, really you can use a formula once you resonate the, the coil uh, with the capacitor. You can use a simple formula to determine the, the resonance. Much like I do when I uh, put a known capacitor on a resonator and I use my generator and scope and then use the resonance frequency formula backwards and uh, work out the L. But uh, as an added convenience we have this little guide on the front of the meter and uh, there's a separate scale here for inductance in red which is really interesting. If you tune uh, in this range that they're talking about here at these frequencies and uh, for different ranges they have different frequencies. Let's say we think we have a you know something between 1 and 10 microhenries. If we resonate um, at 7.9 megahertz okay, setting our, our scale uh, over here for 7.9 megahertz so we are in the correct scale. We've set the dial for 7.9 megahertz and we know according to this scale that we can now read directly in microhenries. So let's look for the the peak. There it is. Wow, oh, we've got too much drive here. Let's bring that back. Doesn't really matter for this. We're just looking for the peak. And it is reading 1.8 microhenries. Remember, we estimated that these coils were running around 1.8 microhenries. 
and uh, the meter is giving us a direct measurement of the inductance of the coil. We can put the toroid on there, turn the drive down, the toroid in, which was very close by the way. We remembered uh, by coincidence the air inductor and the toroid were both very similar in inductance. Okay. Yeah, see it's reading a little bit. So bring this up to two. Of course the not giving us the same cue that the air coil is, but again, uh, just a little below 1.8 microhenries on this toroid. We can try another coil. Okay, I've put a larger coil on here, so I've dropped down to the 2.5 megahertz frequency, which is one band lower. Set this for 2.5, and it's reading about 52. And this is marked 470, so I imagine this is a 47 microhenry choke. And this is reading 52, so interesting. The Q is very low, by the way, on this particular unit. It's a, a ferrite-loaded coil of some kind. You're not getting the kind of Q that you would on an air inductor or even a toroid with this thing. But this is probably made for a broadband power type filtering. Okay, I've got a uh, sort of a little Teflon form that looks like it's got about 15 turns on it. Just a little unknown homemade choke of some kind. I'm at the higher range, which is 12 to 25 megahertz, and this reads 0.1 to 1 microhenry, and it looks like we're getting a peak at 2. So that's 0.2 microhenries, 0.2 microhenries, or 200 nanohenries. So I want to try to measure the dielectric constant of an insulator, specifically this chunk of FR4. And uh, I'm going to cut a 2 by 2 inch piece of this insulator and then use this uh, copper tape. And I will tape each side, forming a capacitor, and then uh, put a couple leads on it and we'll measure the capacitance and we'll try to determine the dielectric constant of the material using the Q-meter. So this tape has a uh, an adhesive on it that's going to stick right to the FR4. That should not disturb the measurement very much. Typically in the old days when they made the measurement on the machine and they actually cite this in the manual, they would just put some Vaseline on the dielectric and then uh, use regular aluminum foil to attempt to make the measurement. We're a little more sophisticated. We've got some nice 3M type uh, copper tape and I think we can make a good measurement with this. Okay, so we have produced a nice 2 inch by 2 inch capacitor 0 0.062 thick dielectric using FR4. Looks like it's reading just below 68 puff. I'll figure 4 or 5 puff of uh, stray capacitance. So let's call it a 62 puff capacitor. Um, I was on the higher range and it was below 80 but I was right on the edge of the scale. So I went down one range and now we're getting 68 on the meter. So we're, we're going to call that like a 62 puff cap. Okay, so I went ahead and I marked the homemade capacitor 62 puff. And let's see if we can measure it. I have my high Q coil, and we're on 300 picofarads, and I'm just maxing it out. Okay, it's maxed out. Now let's attach the capacitor. OK, 
Okay, he's on there. Now we're going to lower the capacitance until we get a peak. There's 20 puff, 40 puff, 60 puff. There it is. Oh yeah, right on the nose. The Q meter agrees with the uh, with the capacitance meter almost exactly, even though both instruments are ancient and uncalibrated. So that's a 62 puff cap. Notice that the Q value is much lower now. So this is not a great capacitor as far as Q goes. So let's take a look at the typical capacitor. And this is what we've produced. We have a, a couple of plates with a dielectric in between. There's a certain distance and a certain area of the plates. The formula, and this one's a little more complex because it, it depends on the dielectric constant of free space, which is 1.000, and the dielectric constant of the material times the area. And uh, we divide that by the distance to get the capacitance value. So this formula has been put online in many little calculators that you can use. And it simplifies down. And uh, with our simple two-plate capacitor, removing the dielectric using air, it comes out to 14.5 picofarads. That's where we started. Now we're at 62 now with the dielectric. But we started at 14 picofarads. Uh, here's another online calculator. It's essentially giving the same value. And I just wanted to show you that's uh, how we theoretically came up with 14.5 picofarads for air. Um, you can do some very fancy modeling, which will take into effect uh, skin effect, fringe uh, capacitance on the edges of the plates, and so on. But this is the very simple answer. It's about 14.5 picofarads. So Q equals 104, okay, and the capacitance value is 62 puff, and using that data we should be able to calculate the dielectric constant of the FR4 board. So let's try that calculation. So the formula in this case for dielectric constant is simply the dielectrically loaded capacitance value divided by the free space capacitance value. And it looks like uh, you fool around with the amount of resin versus glass, and you can make that look like uh, we've got a good number. So next I've got this magnificent chunk of 3 16 fiberglass board. Uh, this is used in a lot of uh, military projects and so on. You guys might recognize this stuff. And I'm going to make a similar 2x2 two two capacitor out of that. Let's see if we can determine the dielectric constant of this material. Okay, the, uh, the thicker dielectric is, re is reading 30 puff instead of 62. And uh, the thickness is roughly 3x, what we had before. Um, I didn't quite get the size perfect, so it's a little less than 2 square inches. But it uh, looks like we, we have 30 picofarads. And uh, the Q is higher. It's reading uh, something on the order of 75 times 2. So that's 150. So that's much better than the other material. So here's the 3 16 dielectric material that we're going to be testing. So the first thing we're going to do is try to calculate the air, uh, the air value of this capacitor before we put the dielectric in. We're going to do that two ways. We're going to do it with the Q meter, trying to measure the capacitance, and then we're going to calculate the capacitor value using a formula, and then we'll insert the dielectric and try to measure the capacitor and see what the difference is. So I expect that uh, our resonance is gone. We're going to need to lower the cap to re-establish resonance, and there it is. So that is 12 picofarads. 12 picofarads is what I'm getting on this. 
and notice the Q is very high because this is an air capacitor. I wouldn't expect that our Q would be damaged very much. So I got uh, 250 for Q without the capacitor and we're reading about 94, almost 200 for a Q on this guy. This is a much better dielectric. I'm going to call it 190 uh, and we're reading 30 picofarads. So we started at 250 for a Q with the original cap. Uh, we're reading 30 puff and we have a Q of 190. This is a much better capacitor with the triple thickness of whatever this material is. So you thought I was going to let you go without any theory? Hey, there's something funny going on here. Why did the capacitance value go up when we added the dielectric? And we're talking about the same spacing. How does adding a dielectric material increase the energy storage capacity of the capacitor? More energy is being stored within the dielectric. Let's consider what atoms look like in the dielectric. The insulator's nuclei have very strong bonds with their planetary electrons. Under potential, the electrons will want to move upwards toward the positively charged plate. But the strong bonds within the nuclei resist this, and this causes stretching or an elliptical orbit to be formed around the atoms. It's like trying to pull a planet out of its orbit. It takes additional energy. Thus, more energy can be stored within the capacitor than with a vacuum or an air dielectric. So it's a distortion of the orbits of the electrons and the changes in the electrons in respect to each other that change the dielectric field within the various atoms of the insulator and these tend to neutralize the field caused by simply the charge on the plates. Thus the total dielectric field becomes the field created by the charge on the capacitor plates plus the dielectric fields around the atoms of the insulator. In an AC circuit, more current will actually flow now with the dielectric in place. So in addition to the size and closeness of the plates, we now have a third condition. That so in conclusion, the dielectric constant or the relative permittivity, that's the new term, of the insulator material determines the amount of added energy capacity that the material has. Mica, for instance, is 3 to 6. Glass is 5 to 10. Most plastics are between 2 and 4, and we know now that circuit boards are usually between 3 and 5. So, still don't believe that that dielectric uh, can take something like this and increase the capacitance many times? Well, let's consider our old friend the variable capacitor. This is our air variable, right? We all use these. Broadcast radios have used these for years. How did those Japanese figure out how to do the same thing in these little tiny packages? Okay, maybe the spacing's closer? I don't think so. So have you ever taken one of these capacitors apart? You quickly realize that they've put some plastic material between the plates. Well, that plastic material between the plates is not just for insulation. That's the way they're multiplying the capacitance value to be able to fit it into such a compact space. Okay, I hope you can forgive some of my math skills and uh, some of the shortcuts I've taken in this video. And uh, if you guys discover something I've done grossly wrong, with some of the, uh, the work, uh, put it in the comments so other folks can learn.